Welcome to the interview. This is my dream lead music, but I can't really use it because of licensing, so I can play it here. All right. Uh, I'm Ciara Pressler, and this is pre-game live from not HQ, but live from my apartment. Um, I've been wanting to do a live Friday live stream um, for a long time now and no time like the present to <laughs> work with uh, streaming video online. And so we're kicking off with the first interview today, which is going to be with Nick Onkin. I'm really excited about it. Uh, we are going to dive into all kinds of topics about the life of a professional photographer, but also more broadly, a creative person and um, a person in this world at this time, especially with our respective quarantine situations. And so I hope you'll emerge from this with some new perspectives, some new thought, um, some creative inspiration, and a new friend in Nick. I love that. We all have the power to choose our lives. Welcome, Welcome. Nick Tonkin. Put your hands in the air. Welcome, Nick. <laughs> I've unmuted you, Nick. You guys might want to put it on speaker view so you can see what's going on. Um, Nick, welcome. Where are you at? Where are you dialing in from? Thanks. I am in Brooklyn, New York. I hope everybody could have heard the audio on that. I didn't hear anything. Oh, uh, no. Okay. Well, we're figuring things out here. Um, so you're in Brooklyn. Of course, New York is, uh, is, uh, going through this on a whole other level than we are. So, um, what's the tone like there? How are, are you in an apartment? Like, how are you getting through this? Uh, you know, I am in my apartment. Um, you know, this. I well, I mean, my place, my space is set up pretty well for uh, like a quarantine on a regular basis. So it's kind <laughs> of nice when I'm home and not traveling. I'm usually pretty like I'm just here working all day. I'll usually socialize at night, but uh, that's kiboshed at this moment. But I've hardly left the house. I went to the grocery store a couple of days ago, and that was oddly apocalyptic. And um, so I just like, I don't, you know, I haven't really hardly been anywhere, to be honest, in like 20 in like three weeks. I've only been like a few places, mostly the grocery store, <laughs> mostly get mostly to get food. Um, Good. I'm glad you're eating. <laughs> I think uh, based on, um, you know, that video and everything else I've seen from you, is this the longest you've stayed in one place in years? I mean, you're used to being all over the world. Yeah, getting there. I mean, I probably I've been here for like a, probably a month is probably the longest I've spent home, and we're coming up on that time time marker here <laughs> in this next actually in a couple of days. Um, but yeah, I'm usually traveling all over the place. I've already I was in LA three times this year already in January, uh, but everything's canceling now. A lot of the photo shoot I had like a three photo shoots had to cancel or reschedule and. Um, I'm trying to just stay busy here in the office, creating what I can while maintaining my own sanity. Yeah. Uh, so how are you doing that? How are you staying sane? Uh, well, for me, like I, I have like some tools in my toolbox, like meditation and breath work, and um, you know, I went through a, a bit of a hard, uh, dark time a couple of years ago. So I, I kind of discovered these tools back then, and I, you know, utilizing them more now um, as well, just to like. Uh, let the the fear and the survival mode kind of subside and and get out of the head get out of the old head and um, try to get back into a space of creation of you know where I can I mean I could I can do a lot here I was actually just trying trying out a uh, FaceTime photo shoot with a friend of mine right before this how do you do a FaceTime photo shoot <laughs> well it's interesting I was that I was just using it as a test to see if how I could actually do it but I have her I had her she's in LA and she's got a nice bright space in her like or in her apartment she's an interior designer um and so i was just having her i had her put the with her iphone or her or her uh ipad up and then had her moving around the room and i was photo i was actually photographing the screen and but giving her direction on what to do that's so creative so I have a couple other friends doing it or doing stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm just like experimenting at this point to like figure out, you know, what can I do? Right. Here. So with, with upcoming shoots being canceled, does that, you know, how do you feel about your career as a photographer 
with not being able to do as much travel and do do live events and live shoots? I mean, it definitely makes me appreciate my job for sure. I mean, obviously, like I have no idea what's going to happen, you know, and it makes me wonder what I'm going to have to do to adapt, you know, however long this takes to to push through and to get get out of this lockdown. Um, I don't know what that looks like, you know, I don't know, you know, if that looks like I'm still going to, I'll always be shooting and I'll always be a photographer. I think that's one thing that, you know, this has also made me realize, like, I love, I love taking pictures at what capacity. I don't know. We'll see where the economy ends up, you know, we'll see, you know, I'm sure it'll bounce back, but at this point it's, there's no point in like getting wrapped up in the uncertainty of it all. Cause that's kind of what makes everyone go insane. That yeah. makes me go insane is trying to project the future. Um, yeah. And the truth is, is like at this point, there's no way of knowing the future. There's no way of knowing like what's going to come. You know, there's the, the artist, like career as an artist is already has like a huge level of uncertainty. And this just like amplifies that uncertainty because we don't know, you know, there's this level of like, I don't know how to make, you know, there's, I don't know when the next job is coming. And then there's this whole other level of like, okay, now you, can't even work for however long this is going to be so for me that's created a lot of anxiety and that, that i've had to work through over the last couple of weeks but i'm kind of planning that out and i just learned about the uh the small business uh like forgivable loans so i'm trying to apply for those and uh, you know to at least pay the rent and payroll and stuff like that yeah do you have a team do you have people that work for you uh, not on payroll. I'm the only one on payroll. So, mm -hmm. I mean, on my business is set up as a Nest Corp and I just have myself on payroll, but I'm still, I'm still learning about how all this is working and how, uh, who, like what, what we're actually eligible for and whatnot. But I think the government's actually, it's not, from what it sounds like, I just talked to a financial planner a friend of mine and he was basically saying that the government's just printing money to keep the economy going. So yeah, that's my understanding too. My business is set up the same way. Um, I'm the only employee and then we have subcontractors. So uh, we are all trying to figure it out right now together. Exactly. <laughs> Photography is not the only thing you do. You have, uh, I talk about having a pie chart of different things we do, whether for money or as part of our business. So what do you do beyond photography? I mean, my life is filled with creative projects, one of them being making hats, like this one here. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and and um, you can kind of see some of the art in the background. I'll make, I haven't done any art in a while, but like, because the hats have kind of been my art, they're art pieces in and of themselves. Where do you uh, sell? They're on the Instagram. It's just Ankin Hat. And uh, I'll post new stuff on there. I'm kind of been slowly developing the website, but. You know, I'm not trying to do, you know, now that we're in quarantine, it's probably the only thing that I can really like sell and make money at right now. Um, you've been doing the podcast for what, four years? Uh, yeah, longer actually. I can't remember. It's like probably six years now. You were podcasting before everyone was podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I got kind of started more in the beginning. I mean, there was still a lot of podcasts when I started, but yeah, I've been doing it for quite a while now. <laughs> Tell us about the podcast. What was the vision for it? How has it um, transformed over the years? Well, I started the podcast with, because uh, my friend Lewis Howes actually interviewed me on his podcast. And I was like, wow, that was really fun. I have a really great network. Um, I can, uh, I should just interview all my friends. So that's kind of where I started. And, and I was doing a, an emotional intelligence and leadership training program right, right around that time. So it just kind of gave me a different perspective on life and business and entrepreneurship. So, um, and I had, ha I had had a blog that I was writing for probably since I started photography. Uh, and I kind of just kind of parlayed what I was doing with the blog into the podcast. So it was like, I started just, it's literally on the creative process, living, a highly creative optimized life so just living a life in color with the lens through the lens of creativity with like creativity being the forefront um kind of guiding guiding principle of the podcast so i'd be interviewing different people um around those things mostly artists so anywhere from, from like lewis to usher to donna karen to um 
even then Mark Manson who wrote Settle Art, I'm Not Giving a Fuck, um, other photographers. So it's just like a, a wide range of creatives. And then, you know, as like the last couple of years have gone, like I've gone, you know, a lot more into wellness and spirituality and personal development stuff. So some of it's skewed a little bit that way, but, you know, still artists. I interviewed this guy, Benjamin Shine, who's the, he does this, he's an amazing artist um, who does stuff out of tool, which you make tutus out of, but he makes these faces, like he'll <laughs> like make, create like depth, he'll, like iron, the tool to like a canvas and create like he'll like create depth he'll create like shadows out of just the density of the fabric and he does faces like he so he had sold a piece to Beyonce and like some other big artists and stuff like that his work is incredible so it's, it's just kind of like all within that world um, yeah that's something optimization through creativity I love that. Yeah, it's something that strikes me about you that I've always admired that you are a very generous creative person. I think sometimes if we're feeling a sense of um, lack or competition, we don't want to share our resources with other people, but you're very open about telling people how they can optimize their own creativity and their own network um, and their lives, really, their approach to everything through your writing and through your podcast. Where, where do you get the strength to be to to approach your career and your life with generosity? Well, I would probably say that started way back when when I started. Um, what got me into photography? I pitched a nonprofit design client uh, to split the expenses on a trip to Africa to build them a photo library pro bono, and like doing that trip opened my eyes in two different ways. Uh, first of all, it just opened my eyes to the world of the developing world and being immersed in a in a world where nobody has anything yet they're happy and grateful and they would give you the shirt off their back and so that shape shifted the way that i've seen my career and seen my life so i've been i've integrated a lot of that into you know my business and giving back not only in you know donations through education but also i mean this is probably also another just the creation of the knowledge platform uh, so from the from the bot the blog to the podcast and the now it's obviously social media and Instagram and stuff like that um, that it also is a is a creative outlet in and of itself so uh, but it's all it's always I've always believed in this and the idea of giving back and making the world a better place and um, you know the more you give back the more your life amplifies so because you're just you're just giving it you're cycling and you're you're cycling that energy and giving giving back to the world that's awesome so take us back um to how you even got into photography in the first place has it been your career the entire time um no i was a graphic designer for five years i grew up in seattle um and went to school for graphic design did that for a few years and then where'd you go to school i just went to community college nice in seattle uh, yeah 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 shoreline community college yeah basically an extension of high school <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah so i did that and then i slowly i went i was working for a book publisher designing book covers for a little while and then i moved into i went freelance uh graphic design I was designing logos and websites and brochures and, and different things like that and then i discovered photography i picked up a digital camera just to shoot um content for my design work and then it just, I started to enjoy it a lot more. And it eventually just, you know, then I did that trip to Africa. And then like after that, you know, kind of opened my eyes to the world of actually being a photographer. I didn't even know that was an actual career at the time. I didn't know, I didn't even know you could run a business. I didn't know you could make money at it. I thought it was, I just never even knew how photography even existed in the world um, from a creation standpoint. Um, but I had another photographer in Seattle that was like helping me just, he was like, I would like fire questions to him and he would like help. He was so kind to answer, answer the questions. And eventually it just, yeah, it was, it turned into this, you know, it really catalyzed my interest in it. And I just started, I was, I started shooting more on my own and started developing that, that going down that path. But it took a couple of years of like doing graphic design projects and photography projects and building my portfolio all along the way well i mean your portfolio is incredible you've done amazing shoots you've shot like the top 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 stars and celebrities and and just 
had the opportunity to meet so many people, but you know, something we talk about at pregame all the time is success, you know, overnight success takes 10 years. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, how you got to a place where it was a full-time job for you, let alone some of these you know, bigger projects that are the notables. I'm, I'm guessing those didn't happen in your first year out. Um, it took a couple of years to get kind of get started. And then like I had, I it took a couple of years before I had a job. I got that job for Nike. And then I thought I was in, I thought the ball was rolling. And then like, I didn't see anything like that for two years. And this wow. was, I was shooting, my first big job was shooting these pro sports players like Ben Roethlisberger and Brian Urlacher and Albert Pujols and these guys that I pretty much had to Google when they called me because I had no idea who they were. Apparently, they were like, big deal. Um, and that was kind of the kickstart. But yeah, like I said, I didn't um, see any jobs like that for a couple of years. So I was still shooting like smaller stuff. I was shooting a few weddings here and there, uh, just model tests and just I kept building my portfolio until, you know, probably a good five years it's a really good a good five years which i roughly estimated to be around ten thousand hours to where people started to really start calling me and like wanting to like work with me um and then like 2008 is when i got an agent like a bigger agent in new york and and uh i moved out to new york in 2009 but that whole year that was probably one of the biggest years that i've I had my career uh, and that's when my career really took off was when I got that agent and um, kind of blasted into it. So what kind of things did you start shooting because you had an agent running for you? Well it was more the big advertising campaign so you're which you move into like a big production type of thing where you have like 20 or 30 people on set so I'll have like three assistants I'll have a digital tech that runs the computer I'll have like hair, makeup, styling. They all have their assistants. I'm working with the creative director. I have a producer that runs point on everything. So like anything that I need, the producer goes and, and makes it happen. So, but they're like organizing all the locations, all the models, the talent, the catering, you know, just taking care of everything behind the scenes. Um, so my first job, once I got my agent was for uh, secret deodorant. Uh, wow, fancy. Yeah. <laughs> fancy but that was my first time working on a huge production and I was just figuring it out as I went like my reps helped me find a good producer down in Miami and we had to go through the whole process and um and you know production pre-production process doing the casting and um you know we ended up having to shoot it was a full day shoot um in Miami so the, the shot was this girl in a bikini jumping into a pool at a pool party with like the perfect like secret like positioning <laughs> like pose in the air so we had to shoot you know it is shoot these girls jumping on a trampoline against a back background black background um to get like just get them to have the perfect form so that they could use that stuff and comp like comp it together later and then at night uh we had to shoot parties so we had this like mansion that we shot at and it was like uh it was at night so the lighting's a little bit tricky but then we had to have extras as well so there's probably like 15 extras at the party in the background and you know i'm trying to manage like 25 people like that are working for me essentially and telling them what to do even though i'm still trying to figure this out as i go <laughs> so i will um, never look at a deodorant ad the same way again <laughs> It's, cra it's crazy and then they ended up like frankensteining it together like in post in photoshop so they were like you know they took an arm from one photo a leg from the other photo they took her like face from another photo it was wild you know, they just like you know but i hand i just handed them a hard drive at the end of the shoot and like they went to town on it that's nice you didn't have to do all the shopping yourself <laughs> no i just walk in i rolled up i shoot and then i everybody it's like one of those things where like everything's done for me yeah and, everything done and taken care of and then I, we, we finish and then fly home um, so that's advertising um you know i know on the editorial side you've had the chance to to shoot i mean you've shot some celebrities and gone you know to all corners of the world um tell us what it's like to to walk into that kind of situation uh, well, celebrities, I haven't really, sh I've shot a couple celebrities for editorial, which has been interesting. 
I shot Simon Baker for Mary Claire one year on the beach. And that was interesting because like they wanted a shot of him. It's like a shot of him like on a skateboard with a surfboard in his hand and like a wetsuit tied around his waist. And I get on set and they were like, he was like, I don't want to do this shot. I'm not going to go shirtless. And then try to figure out how to like get something else done. You know, he didn't like any of the, the, the clothes that the stylist had brought. And we ended up just like, getting a white t-shirt and shooting him in a white t-shirt on the beach and having it. And then he ended up rolling around in the sand. He went in for a surf, came back out and was all wet. And he just like started rolling around the sand. <laughs> it was so funny. Cause he was like, we used to do this as a kid. Like where you come back in, you just roll around in the sand. You just get sand all over him. I was like, Oh man, I would not want to be like having like sand all over my clothes wet. <laughs> but apparently that's what they did as kids. And he just turned into a little kid on set. Like he was just like rolling around laughing. And I, sh I was just like, I snapped those moments. And like that ended up being what the magazine loved the most. Wow. So, How do you get people to that uh, emotional place where they're going to give a genuine photo like that? Especially if you're dealing with a professional actor who might have several layers you have to break through. Yeah, I think some of them are, it's just kind of like, for me, it's been, you know, asking, asking them questions and figuring out what they like and what they enjoy and building a rapport with them and, you know, getting them to kind of open up. And um, so I think building the rapport, rapport is the first thing and then kind of seeing, getting an, a feel for what they'll do. Um, but then you have to also balance that with what the magazine or the creative director wants. Um, you know, and trying to get the, get what they want for, uh, for them as well. So it's kind of a little bit of, you just kind of like, you just got to really like dive in there with that person and feel them out and kind of figure out where, where you can take it. Well, then you've got people on the other end of the spectrum. So I know you've had the chance to uh, work with or be in the same room as the Dalai Lama. What was that about? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, my friend, um, my friend actually hosted an event with him as wow. a speaker, um, and so I was basically, photo he just let me come and photograph at the event, and so the, the shot that I got of the Dalai Lama actually was him speaking, but it, I just kind of took all the elements out that made it look like he was just like sitting there, um, and like hanging out, so uh so that was you know but it was like you could feel his energy it was really beautiful wow um and i think i got to shake his hand at least once during that during during the whole thing but it went by so fast it was just this whole kind of like surreal moment wow are there any dream gigs you haven't done yet that you'd love to do at this point uh yeah there's a lot there's a lot of celebrities and stuff so i mean i think one of my big dreams would be to make a hat for Pharrell and photograph him and interview him. So this bring seems highly likely to me because that is a Pharrell style hat. Yeah, it could be very highly likely. Uh, I'm like one step, one degree away from him. So um, it's just a matter of timing and, and finding the right, the right moment. Nice. Uh, are there any jobs that you turn down now? Uh, yeah, I'll turn down a lot of jobs. I'll turn, like, if they're smaller, I don't, I don't do events, I don't do weddings, I don't do, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it revolves around budget, um, and, uh, what people have to spend on, an, on whatever it is that they want done. I don't really do port, I don't do product, I don't do e-com, so I usually pass those off to other people. Do you have a network of people that you refer back and forth on, on certain projects or does it all go through an agent? No, I mean like those types of jobs, I usually have, I know different photographers and like my old assistant and, you know, different people will, um, I'll usually refer to them. Nice. Uh, it just depends on who, do, what they need. So like if it's an event, I'll find more of like an event type of photographer. If it's like product, I'll probably find more of a, a product type of photographer. So it just kind of depends on what that person's looking for. I mean, as with any, as with hiring any photographer, you've got to find the, the photographer that fits the style, that does the style that you're looking for, that you resonate with. 
Yeah, talk to me a little bit. Let's let's rewind on this this approach to a creative career because a lot of the people on the call with us today um, have some version of a creative career. So uh, one thing we talk about sometimes is um, you know who you surround yourself with. Do you hang out with a lot of other photographers or like who keeps you in the in the zone that you need to be in for your career and maybe how has that changed over time? Yeah, I mean, I don't hang out with any photographers. Actually, I have one one of my really close friends is a photographer, but we don't really hardly ever talk about photography. Okay. Uh, I guess for me, like I've, I don't really talk. I don't. Yeah, I hang out with more. Like my world now is entrepreneurs, to be honest, um, and other artists here and there. Um, but a lot of my friends are are definitely like high level entrepreneurs, authors people writing books, people speaking. They're also my clients now as well. So um, I'm doing a lot of personal branding work for um, for entrepreneurs. So that's probably a big transition into yeah. that space. And so like a lot of those people are my friends So and their clients. So uh, but yeah, I'm, I was trying to remember, I think you and I met we, through Josh, right? yeah Seattle connection and that was you know he's creative but he does all kinds of different things and his wife is a professional dancer and i maybe we met at one of their house parties in brooklyn <laughs> yeah i think it was one of their house parties yeah in brooklyn back in the day when they, when they probably did. like 2012 maybe uh, a while ago 2011 yeah it's been a hot second yeah yeah uh, but i you know for me i love to hang around people that are like you know have a big they're playing a big mental game and like they're successful and you know people that I want to like that I aspire aspire and inspire um because it just raises my game I think you know being around people who are positive and who are creative and who are like you know creating new things and and putting a lot of good out into the world or it's the people that I'm I tend to hang out with Talk more about the the mind game of, of being a professional creative. Um, I know one of your podcast episodes, you talk about like <laughs> dealing with making a bad stuff or, <laughs> you know, stuff that maybe isn't the quality level you want or, you know, what are some of the, the tools you use to keep your, your mind in the game? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the mental game is huge. And from all the people that I've interviewed over the, like the whole podcast is like, the, the thing that made them successful was the mental game, the, the piece that like lets them not get defeated, pick up and keep moving and keep creating even if they fail or if they produce like just something terrible, you know, that they hate, you know, it might be great to somebody, uh, but they hate it. They're not feeling good at, about it. They feel like it's a failure, you know, and then to pick up and keep, you know, use that as a learning lesson, you know, to see it, like look at it from the perspective of it's just a, it's, it's a way to learn and you're going to keep up and get going. And you like, you push through the hardship, you push through everything. And that's, those are the, those are the, all from all the successful people that I've interviewed, that's kind of been like the consistent mindset. So, but that takes a big mental game that takes, you know, mastering your mental game from, you know, whatever, you know, for me to like a lot of that stuff has been health, wellness and, and, so eating well, exercising, meditation, breath work, anything that like optimizes your, your actual like human. Because when you're optimized, then you're gonna be more in a creative state. You're gonna be able, you're gonna be in a higher emotional state, which is way better, especially, I mean, we're, you know, we're all entrepreneurs. We gotta figure out how to create money through what we do. And um, being in a high vibrational emotional state is really the space to produce the biggest results. So doing the things, the practices and all that stuff to, um, to get there, I think is, is key. I appreciate you talking about that. And I think, you know, those of us, some of us have had to learn it the hard way <laughs> and you reference going through a, a dark time in 2018. Um, do you mind sharing more about that and how you, how you, what you learned from it or what you got out of it? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think a big, a big piece of it, I was dating somebody and through that whole, that whole relationship, my business was kind of turning upside down because the commercial world of photography is kind of turned upside down now. 
um, mainly due to the digital revolution, the second digital revolution. The first one was digital photography going from film to digital. Second one was the world of social media where it, like a, it became more about, it's become more about the channel and the following and the, the marketing channel than the actual quality of the work. And then you have clients that need to crank out 10 times more shoots for the same budget. So, you know, you throw that into the mix of everything and then you get, and then you have like a greater number of photographers because access to digital photography is so cheap and access to knowledge is very cheap online. Yeah. Get courses online and learn how to do it for free. And if you're like a self-starter, you just learn and then you make it happen. And you know, that's how I got into it myself. That was when digital, that was when like it, this, the learning curve was a lot longer because the technology wasn't quite there as it is today where it's like you can get, I, you know, the iPhone for crying out loud, like I can shoot amazing photos on the new iPhone and, you know, it's like the phone that's always with you. It's like in your pocket. Um, you know, there's still obviously a difference, but it depends on the it depends on what you're going for. You know, if you know what you're doing as a, as an artist, you can manipulate the tools to get what you want. Yeah. Um, for me. So with all that, the dip really came from a, like trying to have to figure out how to rebuild my business, um, to make money, the same amount of money that I was making before, or like, and like even close to that, um, in a world where an in industry was just crashing down or shifting and changing. Um, and so that pushed me into like this downward spiral because obviously like, um, it becomes as an entrepreneur, like the ups and downs, like you are your business essentially. And especially as a creative and especially if you, you know, for me, like my emotional health was tied to my work and who I was in my work and the ego of that. Mm. And when that went crashing down, I went crashing down, but I didn't have the awareness to understand what that even meant. So, um, you know, a lot of it was developing emotional awareness and emotional intelligence around that. And then utilize, being able to like navigate the physical stuff that was happening, just like the, uh, like, like not work, not coming in and, you know, losing bids and like doing all these things, you know, cause you know, this is like a, there was a, there was a time that I was losing all these commercial bids to a lot of these young photographers. Cause they'll take them for free or take them for like way less than I can even compete with. Um, cause at a certain point it doesn't even make sense for me to take a job. And so like, that's what I was experiencing. You know, there's probably also an energetic, um, shift that happened like along, you know, when I got, I got burnt out, like when I was like working so hard or working so much. So there was probably, you know, looking back on that, I can see that as well as part of the, uh, the cause. So I don't think my energy was my outwardly my outward energy was reflecting um my like just the enthusiasm and things like that so there was a whole lot of things to the mix and then i ended up going through a breakup um with this woman and then like that just kind of created a space for me to like do this deep dive and in, um into my own inner like inner world and start you know pretty much had to rebuild everything from there and so what so did you do i know a road trip was part of it always a good good antidote yeah i mean there was road trips there was psychedelics there was plant medicine there was breath work there was energy healers there was uh you know um meditation there was a lot of reading of books uh you know a lot of spiritual books a lot of emotional intelligence books a lot of different things to really understand you know my own mental game my own emotional game and spiritual game I think that's like been a huge, that was a huge part of the process. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was like a, a good couple of years to where I was getting, I got to a space where I actually felt like on a roll, felt, felt good again. Even now I'm like, I, I was just getting my business into a groove and then like coronavirus happened. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're all going through that right now of, of the, radical shift and we don't know what it's going to look like and it's a demand on us as business people it's a demand on us as spiritual people to navigate this time we don't even know how long it's going to last so it's sort of like your summer of 2018 all over again for everybody yeah exactly i feel like i'm like 
back to like that era again in a certain sense of it but in a whole different awareness one thing i always like to get from you is recommendations because you are always like searching and discovering and curious and different resources so um i know you have some favorite books or or podcasts or other things what what do you recommend um, for someone who's on this kind of journey right now um i love russell brand's podcast he's probably one of my favorites right now he's he's just like perfect mix of like spirituality creativity and like culture um so that's been he i listen to his stuff a lot i've been i mean I, I listen to a lot of um this guy my buddy luke story he's got a he's a biohacker so he has a lot of biohacking um information on different like just different tools and, and devices and whatever you can come up with his stuff is great um his, his podcast the lifestylist books i mean there's like joe dispenza becoming supernatural is probably one of my favorite books um his his stuff it's basically he's like the science behind woo so which i it was helpful for me to understand like the science behind how you can heal your body with your mind and then how the science behind how you what like manifestation and and emotional frequencies and how that actually you know how your thoughts um and emotions turn into matter and how all of that works which is amazing um that was one book on the road trip actually um back when the road trip that you're talking about was like the road trip that i listened i had just finished that book as i was getting into portland yeah that's the last time i saw you in person and you were like all all about that book and i think michael pollan's book um as well we were talking oh, yeah. about yeah how to yeah. change your mind also an amazing book um the untethered soul is another really good one by brian singer yeah um Oh man, I have an Amazon Rex page that recommended like uh, that I have like all this stuff on because I like, I turned it so I can remember it. <laughs> I will share that with everybody after this because I think you sent it to me, guys. I'd love to get some questions um, from you for Nick. If you um, go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on that uh, participants, you can raise your hand and I'll um, put your mic on. If you have a question or two for Nick, I would love to get that from you as well. You can do the hand raise function in Zoom and we can take your questions. This is being recorded, just so you know. Uh, Nick, I'm curious if you could have any other career other than photography, what would you want to try? Um, oh man, who knows? Maybe like, maybe it being a, maybe a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you see, do you know who Dean Ice is? Yeah, he's doing like a bunch of uh, lives right now, right? He's killing it right yeah. now. Like Michelle Obama and Oprah, they're all like cruising through his, his DJ sets, his live sets. It's, it's amazing. It's pretty uh, amazing how creative everyone is um, being right now. Exactly. I love that. All right, we've got Dan with a question, just a second here. Uh, all right, Dan, you're on. I'm unmuted, cool. Um, hey, Nick, I've been a big fan for a while. I was actually part of your Neon group on Facebook. Um, oh, amazing, amazing. Yeah, um, what I'm kind of curious about is just, I think everybody who does creative work, they're always trying to work out how do you come up with your own style, the thing that makes you, you in kind of in your creative endeavors and i'm just curious if you have a process there or if there was a moment that you uh that you felt like it started to kind of happen yeah i mean it for me i think it was a matter of of first of all just kind of like seeing what, what i like looking through magazines and you know or like online and finding images that i i was really gravitating towards and then kind of breaking them down to understand like, oh, I like this, I like the lighting on this one, or I like the styling on this one or the location. And just kind of like starting to keep, you can even do like an exercise where you pull like a bunch of tears out and like go through it. And the second thing is how do you start integrating that type of stuff that you like from other people's work into your own work? And that's the other thing is it's like, you gotta create a lot of work and start to like pull the common thread through 
um, but create work that you want to create, right? Like when you start doing work for clients, you're doing work for them. So not, it's not necessarily fully you, you know? So I think the important thing is to create art that, that you want to create. Um, and then you take that body of work and then you start to kind of examine, okay, well, like, what am I defaulting to? What am I, you know, you know, what am I not experimenting? Where do I need to push myself? where what kind of things do I like you know it's like you see you start to do the same things in in multiple pieces of the work and then that can either be you know you got to like think about that as like a is that a space of like okay do I need to push myself or do I you know I like that element I'm going to add that to the to the arsenal to the toolbox um and then it's also you know kind of figuring out like in post and editing is finding you know like and then using like the color palette consistently um, or using something consistently and then taking all those and then you edit everything down right like you edit your portfolio photos out of like the bigger body of work but you can also look at though that edit and kind of pull a story from of, of that and a consistency so you want to make that consistency feel the same across different types of photos so and like one of the big mistakes i see a lot of people do when they edit is they'll like use like four or five photos from the same exact setting set like setup from one photo shoot and you only need one you know so you got to pick the best one from that photo shoot and the best one from another setup or another scenario i mean if it's the same photo same photo shoot but you have different looks and different locations pick one from each but don't pick like three or four from each because they all look the same it's just like a little variation um and then you can take you know, kind of find what's, okay, look at all of them together. Look at the bigger breadth of work all together. And then you create, you start, you can start to see the patterns and you can pull that story from within the patterns of what you're seeing. Um, another way to do it too is like print all of your photo. If you're doing, I mean, I'm taking it, you're a photographer. Uh, take print. I, one thing I did when I was creating a portfolio is I printed everything out on four by six cards, like everything that I wanted to like look at. And then I put them all over the floor and arranged them and just looked at them like from a bird's eye view and arranged them in a perspective and like oh that one doesn't really fit like that one's cool but it doesn't really like feel like me so you can kind of like start to see everything as a whole um like a whole story that's cool well i think I, i'll just i'll add on to that i think it's interesting that your the look and feel and your your creative vision it carries through to the other stuff like the stuff on your wall behind you and I, i've kind of noticed that the, the graphic <laughs> the graphic design and the, and the art and the mixed media stuff it's kind of cool how that is similar to your photography and I, I i see the connections there well thank you yeah and i think it's just like about experimenting as you know as you're talking about it's kind of like oh i, I want to try this idea maybe it works maybe it doesn't work maybe it takes some finesse and some refinement to really push it in that direction if you're feeling it um so that's also something to think about you know like the star like say for instance stars like you can see it in the artwork behind me but it's i'm also using it in the hats and then i'll use it in photographs and then i'll use it like now i'm like i'm kind of playing with dimensions so like i'll photograph hats with the stars um and then maybe even utilize them in the design with the photos afterwards so you know different elements just like pull them in you know you can kind of adopt them into what makes you 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 know that's great. Thanks, Dan. Um, one thing that a lot of our creative friends uh, uh, will struggle with sometimes in pregame, um, those of us who do professional creative work, is uh, balancing all the ideas and like the time you spend doing paid creative work, which you need to like pay for your life, versus just being able to do some of those personal projects that end up feeding the paid work. And and how do you stay on track with some of your goals to develop your business while also exploring the things that are you're really curious about that feed your creativity. Do you have any uh, ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, for, that's kind of what I've been working on the last couple of years, you know, because the commercial work in the beginning was very lucrative. So it was a lot easier to like do a job and then float for a bit and do whatever I wanted. Now, over the last couple of years, I've had to like really just like put a lot of time and energy into marketing and building a business to like bring them, just get the work to come in the door. 
Um, so I think a big piece of it is creating that business structure, which is I'm terrible at. It's like not my zone of genius, um, but I still have to do it anyways. And so I've been working on that. I, I mean, and that's why I was saying, I was like kind of things were just getting into a flow and like just getting moving and then COVID happened. Um, so maybe things are on pause for now, um, but it's just getting like a consistent stream of revenue in to like give you that kind of like security so that you can block out time to do the creative projects. And I'm kind of always doing a little bit of both. I'm always doing some creative stuff, but also paid stuff. Um, I think for me, it's just like, I want to feel, I want to make enough money to feel secure to pay all my bills and, and be able to invest back into the business. Um, and when you can create enough revenue, then you can hire and delegate. So, you know, being able to delegate tasks that you don't need to do, um, that you can delegate to somebody else is huge as well. I used to have an, I used to have two assistants that you saw in the video in my office, um, doing all this, like just non-essential work, whether it was processing photos, designing graphic pieces for social media, um, organized in the back catalogs, you know, doing keywording, all that stuff. Um, I don't need to do that. Like that's something that somebody else can do. And so the balance is finding the revenue to be able to pay for that person. So the more you can like free up your own time, you know, you're basically like, I think investing in an assistant, you're actually buying your time so that you can go and do the other stuff that you want to do, whether that's relaxing <laughs> or like, even like hey being more social um you know it's really about buying your time so that you can create you can just kind of compartmentalize aspects of your life um create that you know with your pie chart right like where you, where is your blocks of time your block of 24 hours going in a day yeah. in, a, in a week and then how much of that can you delegate to somebody else or how much of it do you have to do? I've had to take a lot of that on because I couldn't afford to hire somebody. Like I had to let go of my assistant a couple of years ago. Um, and then now I'm kind of like, I was just kind of starting to get things rolling so I could probably start bringing somebody on. And then now I'm just gonna have to figure out what that's gonna look like and whenever this finishes. But definitely having an assistant was huge. That's a good tip. I think sometimes we're afraid to take someone on and to delegate when we're used to doing everything ourselves, but it's so important and it can really, like you said, buy back your time. Yeah. And I've, my, I've fought it for a long time, even when I was making enough money to have an assistant. And my friend was finally just like, you need to invest in your own time, like buy your time, hire an assistant so that you can free up your time to do whatever you want. And that just, when he said that, like, changed just changed my perspective and then that's when I hired an assistant and I was like oh <laughs> and it worked right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, now I feel more frantic because I don't have an assistant I feel like I have so much to do and like not, not everything gets done I'm like the stop gap in my business not forever um not forever, just at the moment as we approach our final moments, you know, one of the questions uh, we always ask is how do you uh, define success for yourself? How do I define success? Success for me is, you know, A, making enough money to live the life that you want, but like not money isn't the, money's a vehicle. It's not an end all be all. For me, like I want to, I want to live a very social relationship driven life um, creating and traveling and doing all the things that I enjoy doing, uh, comfortably. So, you know, I don't need a mansion. I don't need like cars and I don't need stuff. I like experience. I like relationships. I like, you know, um, feeling good. I like being healthy. I invest in my health, um, supplements and all kinds of, you know, everything, you know, I think for me, it's really about feeling good and investing in the things in my life that will um, get me to feel that way. And what would be, you know, one piece of advice to someone who's just starting out, what, whether in photography or another creative career, but still building up to the point where they're uh, making their full-time income on that or like a known quantity or anybody who's entrepreneurial? Yeah, I mean, I think know your why and why you do what you do because like it's not easy and your why is going to drive you through the hard times and the good times. Um, you know, most people, if they don't know, if they don't love it for the actual sake of creating, they'll quit 
in the in the hard times but if you love what you do for the sake of what it is then that will push you through um the hard times to get to the successful times yeah your generosity is amazing for you to come on and spend this time with us when there's so many other things you could be creating so how can we uh thank you um how can we give back where can we find you online where can we buy a hat give us all the uh the yeah. links and the handles um well the main I, it's funny because i think just instagram at nick Gonkin is my main instagram you can get to the hat the photographs the podcast from there and that's usually where i'll post the podcast stuff the podcast is neon radio n-i-o-n um neonradio.com and then yeah that's kind of the business card i'm working on a new website right now my own personal brand website that's what i've been working on this week so but it's all the same like it's going to have all the same stuff if you want to okay. donate the promise there's i think there's a link on my on my link tree on on instagram um we will send that out to people and uh you even did a pep talk for pregame uh on our in, uh, social media a couple weeks ago so everyone check that out too um any final words for us Final words. Well, stay healthy, stay, stay mentally healthy during these crazy times and stay creating. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick. You have got an alternate HQ here in Portland when we're all back up and running. I hope you'll come in person to the pregame clubhouse and, uh, and hang out with us. And of yeah. course, we'll, we'll shout at you when we are back in New York. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you. All right. It cold like lyrically, I'm a problem. That's when the show starts. I get it livid, I did it. So who the illest spitter? You just